much, uh, Kelly, and uh, good evening, everybody. Yeah, this is going to be quite a challenge to get through these three really hot topics, really big topics, but try and do it in a matter of uh, 20 minutes or so, if that's okay. So, um, <clears throat> stone bench tops here, bushfires and coronavirus. Uh, there couldn't be any bigger topics in, in this country <laughs> right now. So let's, uh, let's rip into it then. Um, so, uh, firstly, uh, six questions we'll try to uh, answer in this uh, limited time. What is the current position of these three issues? Uh, what parallels can be drawn between them? Where do they differ? Where, do they, where are they similar? Um, what role can occupational hygienists play uh, going forward in this area? Um, there's currently a lot of activity with the AIOH, so we'll have a look at a little bit of, of that. And where are the opportunities for improvement? So um, here we have them. Uh, a, a little bit of comparison here. So engineered stone, silicosis, uh, this is really heartland stuff for occupational hygiene. Uh, we're aware that um, uh, this is an issue that's been largely brought forward by one part of the building industry. Uh, there's been some pretty dramatic stuff on the ABC and what carried also with uh, City Morning Herald and the Fairfax media. Um, a lot of stuff that was out there in the last two years on this issue. Uh, occupation, is it relevant? Of course it's, all, uh, it's relevant. And is the Institute active? Very much so uh, over this uh, last period of about 18 months or so. Secondly, we'll have a look at firefighting in the aftermath of that. And uh, as we all know, uh, what's now called um, uh, Black Summer uh, destroyed uh, huge amounts of uh, bushland, on, particularly on the East Coast, and uh, destruction of buildings, uh, some human life was lost, four and four in vast numbers. Um, and this, uh, this story was carried around the world. Uh, it's been uh, uh, quite dramatic, the imagery is quite dramatic, so I'm able to uh, take advantage of that uh, with what comes uh, shortly. Is it relevant to occupational hygiene? Yes, it is. We'll have a little, little bit of a look at that. Is the Institute doing anything about it? Yes, it is and has done, and we'll have a little uh, touch on that as well. Now, the big thing that's out there right now, and uh, if you follow the share market today, you know that the share market's caught under this, but coronavirus is very big, and uh, so those figures are probably out of date, they change by the day. Um, so uh, there's at least 70,000, probably over 100,000 reported cases. Uh, it's in at least 25 countries, 1,500 plus uh, uh, deaths are growing by the day. Worldwide, it's dramatic imagery, um, global impact coming up. Uh, we've seen all sorts of stuff start to emerge now in terms of transport, uh, supply chains, uh, the broad economy, including the world economy, uh, may well be under some sort of threat here, and livelihoods, absolutely. Um, is it relevant to occupational hygiene? Well, I'll, I'll attempt to show how it is relevant. Um, is the Institute doing anything about that? Not right now, uh, but I'm sure they and all of our members would be, uh, would have a role to play later on if this particularly, uh, if this issue becomes particularly relevant in this country. So let's have a look, uh, get into it then. Uh, firstly, um, this particular individual was probably the face of the stone uh, benchtop, the engineered stone benchtop issue. Uh, his name is Tahir uh, Oskol, um, and he's from Melbourne. And um, uh, basically, you can see some interesting things here. He's clearly uh, has worn a respirator of some kind. You can see all the dust uh, around the eyes and so on. Um, as occupational hygiene people, you will recognise that that. Uh, that beard there wouldn't be conducive to a respiratory fit, a uh, proper respiratory fit, but that's, a, that's another issue in there. But as uh, Ryan Hoy, the respiratory physician, said, uh, he, he put it in these terms, uh, the largest occupational uh, lung cancer uh, crisis that we've seen since the peak of the asbestos uh, issue uh, back then in the 60s and 70s. So it's a big issue. Um, this particular <coughs> individual uh, has had a lung transplant uh, he suffered from accelerated silicosis. And um, so, in fact, uh, I was looking at a quote from him today that he felt like a snowman uh, in his work environment. Uh, that's how bad the work environment was. A lot of dry cutting of, uh, of uh, these stone bench tops. So uh, when we look at some facts that go with this, um, since 2018, there's been a surge in the cases of accelerated silicosis in particular. That's usually defined as between five and 10 years of exposure, uh, which fits quite nicely with the advent of stone bench tops as a popular item in kitchens and uh, laundries and these sorts of things. Uh, we've touched on silica already in previous uh, 
presentation, but basically there's chronic bron bronchitis, there's a lung cancer, emphysema, ki kidney damage, and of course the three types of silicosis, acute, accelerated, and chronic. Now in this country, uh, there are three major suppliers, Caesar Stone, uh, Quantum Quartz, and Smart Stone, and they account for about 77% of the industry, <coughs> basically, in terms of importing the, uh, the stone products and then getting these products onto the people that do the installation. Um, unsurprisingly, with uh, the cases that have come along, and they started really in Queensland to a large degree, but as uh, people have got out there now and looked around the states and territories, they've found plenty of cases that are out there. Uh, and there's, uh, not surprisingly again, uh, the lawyers are looking at this as a national class action underway. Now in terms of the, um, uh, the federal government, uh, they did announce uh, uh, last year they were setting up a national dust diseases task force. Uh, and they've committed some money to uh, establish a national dust diseases register and get some research underway. So a lot of research bodies are out there uh, at the moment uh, are fighting for that. And I might add, uh, there's a team uh, that Sharon Gaskin uh, is involved with in South Australia, and they've had success in, uh, in getting uh, funding for some of that uh, uh, research work. So there's a bit sort of happening in the hygiene area and research area. I suppose a big question for all of us is how did this thing happen uh, here in 2018, 19, 20? Uh, how could it possibly happen? We've got such a long history that dates right back, uh, even here in Western Australia, back to the 1890s and the advent of gold mining. Uh, there was a uh, Royal Commission in 1905 uh, into uh, silica-related deaths that was occurring at a huge rate of knots in that, at that time. And uh, the Royal Commission, unsurprisingly, uh, identified that uh, ventilation could play a very major role here. Um, uh, wetting down of surfaces could play a, a major role, and also they recommended some uh, ad, what we would call administrative controls as well. So it's been around for a long time, and uh, the question is, uh, how could that be? Uh, well, we know the answers. It's basically a very small part of the building industry uh, that's pretty much uh, outside of this, uh, the usual surveillance, the usual inputs in terms of uh, uh, safe, uh, safe and healthy ways to carry out work. So uh, if we look at the uh, rather familiar uh, hierarchy controls here, <coughs> we've got the, this is an IOSH uh, representation, but there's the opportunity for elimination and, and uh, even substitution, looking for lower silica uh, products. The engineered stone has about 90% uh, crystalline silica content, so there are other products like granite that are much lower than that. Um, engineering controls up there for isolating people from the hazard. And uh, just um, one thing about that, uh, with um, isolation techniques, isolation can be an engineering control if we enclose uh, the uh, source, if we enclose the receiver, or we put a barrier in, in between the source and the receiver, or it can be an administrative control if we look to separate the individuals involved either in space or in time. So we've got those, uh, those opportunities. Um, uh, administrative controls, there's a whole variety of them there. And then of course, uh, at the end of the uh, hierarchy, controls triangle personal protective equipment. So plenty of uh, opportunities here, and uh, I'll come shortly to uh, what the Institute has been doing to respond to this particular issue that uh, is being quite devastating and extremely graphic when you see it uh, on television. But we come now to the Australian bushfire catastrophe and here's a statement that I found from Reuters. Uh, bushfires are common in Australia's hot, dry summers, but the ferocity and the early arrival in spring has been unprecedented. I um, actually Googled that term and I found that uh, it'd been picked up by news agencies around the world, uh, Japan Times, the Indonesian equivalent and all that sort of thing, pretty much those words. And that summarises it in a nutshell. Uh, that's the issue that uh, has uh, been so dramatic uh, around, the, uh, around the world, uh, in terms of um, getting attention around the world. So what do we know about this in terms of um, some uh, facts? Um, uh, it has been our, 2019 was our hottest uh, year on record. Uh, 2018 and 2017 were uh, somewhat hot as well. Uh, but uh, it's these two factors of heat and dryness that uh, 
seem to be very important influences of uh, fire. Uh, something like 33 kill, uh, people have been killed, and uh, and uh, the amount of uh, of uh, acreage that's been uh, consumed is something like 11 million hectares, which is roughly the size of Ethiopia. Some 50,000 uh, livestock have been killed, over 3,000 homes have been uh, razed to the ground, and it would appear that more than a, a billion animals have been uh, threatened with extinction. Some of you may have seen the uh, program uh, last night with the koalas, that was just one, one element of that. Um, a Royal Commission has been established by the Federal Government and that was just uh, uh, indicated a matter of a couple of days ago. So in terms of where it's been, <coughs> we haven't seen much of it in the west, but in the east from Bensdale in the south through Malakuta, Maitland Bay, in the Blue Mountains, up in the national parks and right up to the north of Coffs Harbour. And the other one that got a lot of attention was uh, the fire over in Kangaroo Island where basically a lot of animals were caught in this and people were quite devastating and the notion of seeing a whole island potentially uh, wrecked uh, by fire, affected by fire, was very vivid I think in all of our memories. <coughs> so um, what can we say about the issues? Well they may be significant, they may be significant ongoing health impacts on fire responders and the public based on the materials that have been inhaled or or where people have come in contact with these. Uh, we do know that um, clean up uh, on some of the, with some of these buildings uh, it will involve uh, uh, people coming in contact with uh, asbestos, there will be lead there, heavy metals. Um, for, for the chrome, um, uh, copper chrome uh, arsenate uh, treated timbers, there will be ash from that material that people need to be aware of. There will be garden and farm chemicals, uh, biological agents, there may be damaged um, gas bottles, um, household uh, chemicals, a whole variety of things will be there uh, awaiting the people that get involved in the demolition work, or the clean up work and the reconstruction work. Uh, the other question that does come up here is, well, uh, what about um, vegetation fires? And yes, they do uh, uh, carry uh, some implications there. Uh, one of our members, uh, Zach Bentley, Zach here tonight, I know he yeah, good day, Zach. Uh, Zach uh, has actually done some work on this, uh, and I've seen some of the, uh, the work. Um, he also presented at the conference last year here in Perth, and uh, he's pointed out that uh, you would expect to find just from the ventilation, just from the vegetation, you're going to find uh, carbon monoxide and formaldehyde. Uh, you're going to find uh, acrolein, some of the VTEX chemicals, some VOCs. There's all those sorts of things that the people that are responding to the fires are going to encounter. So you can see whether it's um, active bushfires or whether it's the aftermath of the bushfires, there's very clear roles in here uh, for all of us to develop the understanding of what uh, is involved in, uh, in contacting uh, those sorts of materials uh, that I've mentioned. <coughs> so main controls of the fire triangle approach, of course, that's what uh, fire responders uh, fundamentally go to. We've seen plenty of examples. Uh, on the news about uh, particularly air supply water, um, the work practices that are there and the question being asked now about uh, was enough done in terms of fuel reduction and these sorts of issues. Uh, we've had lots of controversy over that here in Western Australia since the rolling up fires many years ago. Uh, planning guidelines come into the picture, supervision, audits, checks, personal hygiene, training and awareness, uh, uh, building and then PPE uh, once again. Oh, the other thing I should mention on that is that uh, these fierce fire conditions actually create uh, updrafts of very hot air, which in turn can trigger um, uh, trigger lightning strikes, which uh, again ignites uh, parts of the forest that may have been unaffected. So it just makes the condition and situation even worse. So we'll come now to the coronavirus, uh, more correctly in terms of World Health Organization determining if there's uh, COVID-19, and here are a few issues. Firstly, <coughs> coronavirus uh, is part of a large family of uh, viruses, and they, uh, they tend to circulate, uh, including some that circulate in animals like camels, and uh, MERS was a result of that. Civet cats, uh, these are not um, domestic cats, but they're uh, 
an animal that looks like a cat, uh, a delicacy in part, some parts of the world, uh, but they, uh, they are part of the ecosystem in some of the forested areas. And then bats. Symptoms include uh, fever and cough and shortness of breath and uh, breathing difficulties of uh, various kinds. And here we have um, what we currently know about the mortality rate. Uh, mortality rate, uh, it looks like, uh, for uh, COVID-19 is 2.4%, so it's considerably less than what we saw back in 2002-03 with the SARS uh, issue, about 9.6, and uh, the Middle Eastern uh, Respiratory Syndrome was up around 35%. Now, supply chain impacts are just starting to be felt, and that's what worried the stock market today, and it's becoming more and more clear that, um, uh, that uh, all, all many sectors of industry that are China-related or China-related or, or China-dependent uh, are going to be impacted if this thing gets any bigger. And uh, I guess the looking at uh, everything that I've looked at in the last uh, few weeks, uh, um, it's go only going to get bigger, I think, for us, unfortunately. So, <coughs> some facts of the matter. Um, so, far, so far, 2,100 deaths, uh, at least that. Uh, and all, all but nine of them have actually been in mainland China. Um, the, the infection has uh, uh, impacted on 76,000 people again. Uh, that's probably a lot higher as of today. Um, but all but, uh, all but 1,000 of them have been in mainland China. 29 countries have had cases of the virus. Uh, transmission, here's an important thing, transmission it would appear can occur before symptoms show, so that makes it really difficult to handle, really, really difficult for the, for the authorities to manage. And um, so there's a clear need for better data to confirm the transmission dynamics for this particular virus. I came across uh, a piece uh, recorded in the New York, New York Times, and uh, this lady, the uh, People's Republic of China Vice Premier, uh, Sun uh, Chulin, she had quite a colourful turn of phrase here. <coughs> she said that uh, we will set up a 24-hour duty system during these wartime conditions. Uh, there must be no deserters or they will be nailed to the pillar of historical shame forever. So, well, it doesn't get any more colourful than that. <laughs> um, so here's a little bit of the timeline. And um, here we have the first case was uh, established uh, on the 12th of December it appears, but it wasn't made public. And so there's this whole period of December when things were happening and uh, there was nothing uh, apparent um, outside of uh, perhaps a, a relatively small number of people that were in and around the Wuhan issue. Um, but by the 31st of December, um, the authorities there um, uh, alerted the World Health Organization that they had in fact confirmed 27 cases. So that's when pretty much the world starting to know about this. Uh, the next day, uh, the seafood market uh, was, uh, the Hunan uh, seafood market was identified as a likely source and uh, this is a wet market that um, sells live animals alongside seafood and meat, so it's a terrible mixture in a way uh, of things. Um, and, uh, but the first death occurred, uh, just a, well, initially people thought uh, it was um, it wasn't possible to transmit from person to person, but that eventually changed as it became apparent. But the first death uh, in Wuhan was on the 9th of January. You can see then it didn't take long. Uh, it's uh, only four days, and then the virus was picked up in Japan, South Korea, and the United States. Um, human to human transmission was confirmed only a short time later, another week later. Uh, so that put paid to the idea that no, it has to be from animals to humans. Um, by the 23rd of January, Wuhan was put into lockdown, which is an amazing thing in its own right to put um, uh, 10 or 11 million people into some sort of a, uh, quarantine, I suppose. Um, by the 31st of January, the World Health Organization had declared a, a global health emergency, recognizing that this could go anywhere, really. Um, on the 5th of February, um, there's another turn of events. Uh, 10 passengers on the Diamond Princess in Yokohama Bay uh, confirmed with the virus. And this has particular relevance for me because my wife and I 
together with Stephen Surge and Honey, and Steve's here tonight. We're due to jump on the uh, sister ship, the Sapphire Princess. Don't get too close to me. Uh, the Sapphire Princess uh, departing Shanghai on the 2nd of May for 16-day Grand uh, Asia tour, eight countries, nine ports, all that sort of stuff. So uh, if, um, the, uh, if the issue had been displaced only about nine weeks, we could well have been languishing in Yokohama Bay right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what's happened there, that 10 passengers in the space, you can see in the space of two weeks, have become 542 passengers and crew uh, on the Diamond Princess confirmed with the virus. Uh, I think if ever there's, there's going to be a lot of case studies on this uh, Diamond Princess because uh, it became basically an incubation point. There's the highest rate of uh, infection outside of Wuhan. You've probably read that in the, in the newspaper. And um, what they appear to have done, if you follow that story, is they appear to put a lot of emphasis on the passengers, keeping them in the cabins, giving them a ca occasional bit of air on the front, on the top deck, all that sort of thing. But the crew, uh, and there's, by the way, there's uh, something like uh, uh, 2,000 I think passengers and about 1,300 crew on board. The crew pretty much are in quite different conditions. Uh, they weren't um, tested um, and uh, they were expected to perform the task, mainly to serve the passengers basically. Uh, whether that was a uh, decision by the, um, uh, by the cruise company or Japanese authorities, I think there's a bit of both involved there. But uh, some of the latest figures are showing the crew basically solid story about probably how not to do quarantining. When it comes to quarantining, the idea is that the quarantine protects people outside the quarantine area. It doesn't really protect people inside the quarantine area unless you've got all sorts of other controls in place. I'm sure that if any of us uh, with a little bit of background in health might have been there on board, maybe you might have got the captain's ear or something and, and persuaded them that, uh, that they were just, uh, just heading for trouble. So uh, here we have uh, some before and after situations. So you can see before, that's what um, uh, Wuhan uh, looked like, um, and uh, a nice modern city, uh, 10 or 11 million people. There is the image on the left hand middle there of uh, the, uh, the wet market uh, area, seafood market, um, and some people looking at some of the produce. Some of it's very exotic stuff. Um, live animals, some wild, a lot of wild animals, and then there's all the different uh, seafood type things and uh, meat things. And then there's the current situation where you see empty streets, empty railway stations, uh, empty shops. Uh, this particular shot is the Wuhan uh, uh, railway station. You can see there's uh, guards there to make sure nobody jumps uh, through there. This is a closed uh, wet market. This is a physician being sprayed with something before he goes into a, uh, an operation. Um, so it's uh, very dramatic. In amongst all that, there's some other things that are happening here. Uh, one of the big news items in China, uh, people were following this uh, in, in mass, was the construction of a 1,000 bed uh, hospital in 10 days. What an amazing achievement to do that. Here's the uh, initial activity, here's uh, later in the piece. Uh, to actually do that, and uh, that's in Wuhan. Down here is a temporary facility, I believe it's in a gymnasium, you can see all the beds being laid out uh, in anticipation of things uh, perhaps getting worse. So here's the Diamond Princess, and uh, this is what a crew should look like, all those beautiful scenes on the left hand side there. And, um, and unfortunately, uh, as if you follow the story, uh, it's uh, turned into somewhat of a nightmare. Uh, is the uh, Diamond Princess with some of the attendant ambulances uh, in, uh, in Japan, in uh, Tokyo, and uh, some of the passengers here and some of the, uh, the medical staff uh, walking down one of the, uh, the corridors in the, uh, in the, uh, <coughs> in the ship. Uh, this is what Channel 7 had to say, um, uh, only about a few days ago. And this was gone from one bullet, from one five in the bulletin. It was described as a cruise from hell, cruise nightmare, holiday from hell. So you can understand why people were uh, cancelling their cruise holidays en masse around the world, unfortunately. Uh, just one example here is just uh, 
has, has spooked a lot of people and um, so uh, they're all feeling the pinch at the moment. Uh, the notion then that you know, people worry about being locked up uh, in close confines with others that may, be, uh, may have the virus. <coughs> So plenty of controls here, potentially there. Engineering controls, <coughs> whether that happen to be in ventilation systems on the aircraft. Uh, there's quarantining that I mentioned or isolation uh, that's supposed to work. I think I have to say the Australian authorities so far appear to have done a really good job with what they've done with Christmas Island and the facility uh, outside of Darwin. Uh, plenty of uh, work to be done here on work practices and personal hygiene, absolutely critical. Uh, training and awareness is a big part of it, and then there's the PPE. It's interesting, uh, referring back to the stock market again, that the organisations that are still doing well are those that manufacture uh, gloves and uh, PPE at the moment. They're doing extremely well uh, on the market. So from the Centre for Disease Control and Prevention in the US, basically they said, look, this is our advice to the public. Avoid, cl avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching the eyes, nose, uh, and mouth with unwashed hands, stay home, isolate yourself uh, if you're sick, cover your coughs and sneezes, and that's one of the main ways that this uh, gets transmitted. Um, and uh, disinfect uh, regularly, uh, uh, frequently touched objects and surfaces, and then washing your hands, soap and water uh, is a very important part of the, of the practices. So getting these sort of messages out uh, in the, we're all health related uh, mm. in our work, get these met these basic messages out is extremely important. So here we are, just a comment about um, the um, just a comment about the uh, uh, COVID nineteen. Then a P two uh, uh, filtering respirator uh, can filter out about at least ninety five percent of the very small particles there, including bacteria and viruses. Set it for general use if properly fitted, not to be confused with the medical mask, which uh, and these tend to block liquid droplets. They fully seal them. Now, what's interesting, see a photo shot of the Chinese uh, uh, president, uh, President Xi, uh, with a medical mask on the other day, actually, uh, during the photo shot. External Affairs Committee for the Institute, um, formed 12 months ago uh, by Julia. Uh, it's been, uh, this group's been quite active in a number of roles now, um, looking at emerging issues, such as the ones that we've mentioned here, uh, and, and providing input. On, uh, on guidelines and things as they develop, engaging with the external <coughs> organisations and also assisting in uh, delivering uh, targeted uh, and uh, primarily external communications. So some of the things, uh, <coughs> set up the Brief Early Initiative, um, uh, and that's been very successful, led it to the uh, Federal Minister of Health, uh, Greg Hunt, uh, in regard to uh, long-term health, uh, long health consequences for bushfire smoke um, and the setting up a fund has been part of the result of that and, and input by ourselves and others. Uh, verbal and written uh, submissions to the National Justice Easy Task Force, letters to the Federal Minister of Health and State and Territory counterparts about suggestion about the National Institute being set up. We've had uh, Andrew Orfanis and uh, Julie Norris on the ABC TV radio working closely with these other professional bodies and we're in the process of, uh, we've been doing a lot of lobbying with political parties, and I think one outcome of that is a motion in the Senate, which is starting to recognise the role of occupational hygiene in these sorts of issues. So Brief Early Australia, set up largely in response to the emerging engineering stone bench tops issue, uh, modelled on the UK program, uh, modules in a variety of areas here, and is being rolled out by Institute volunteers, and we've certainly done that here, um, we're uh, looking to uh, work with partners, so uh, fortunately here in Western Australia we have the Commission for Occupational Safety and Health, uh, Demers is a partner as well, uh, WorkSafe WA is a partner, Masterville is a partner, uh, CFMEU uh, with the Mining Division over in Queensland and the Queensland Government's involved and more recently the South Australian uh, St. Louis uh, South Australia is uh, involved as well. So just to wrap it all up then, uh, there's been ample experience in the past with these three issues, so there's no such thing as a black swan here. Um, uh, these are all things that uh, should have been anticipated to some degree. We've had things that have preceded that uh, should have taught us a lot. Uh, the, first, uh, the first one, silicosis, is really mainly a workplace issue. Well, the second one that we looked at, bushfires, is an issue for 
both the worker, the responders, and the communities. And the third actually is an issue for everybody, really, public and respondent. Each issue has revealed gross weaknesses in preparedness, level of preparedness, including recognition of delegation and control. And uh, I, I would say the occupational hygienists are very well equipped to play some role uh, in these issues going into the future. And um, what the Institute has been doing now for the last 12 months in particular is raising the profile of occupational hygiene uh, with a whole variety of groups uh, that are out there. So I think we can be very pleased that that's, uh, we're starting to see uh, a fair bit of recognition creeping in now around occupational hygiene. Well, folks, that's probably it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions?